Welcome to our fourth video in our series on vertebrate diversity. In our last video, we looked at the amphibians. Now we're going to head down the branch of the amniotes, those vertebrates with the amniotic egg. All reptiles, birds, and mammals are considered amniotes. We're going to talk a lot about what amniote means uh, in this video, but let's finish kind of working through our classification key. If a vertebrate um, has, let's go back down here, um, has a jaw, has a skeleton made of bone, has legs, and has an amniotic egg, it's an amniote. Well, the next question we need to ask ourselves is, does this animal have hair? If the animal is yes, we go, answer is yes, we go to mammals. If the answer is no, we go this direction. And if we go this direction, we have to ask an additional question, and that is, do we have feathers? And if the answer is no, then we are at the reptiles. So in this video, we're going to talk about the phylum chordata, subphylum vertebrata, class reptilia. In the class Reptilia, there are four orders. We're going to study three of them, order Squamata, Chelonia, and Crocodilia. The Squamata include the snakes and the lizards. The Chelonia are the tor turtles and tortoises, and the Crocodilians include the crocodiles and the alligators. Now, when we look at reptiles, the first thing we need to look at is kind of the general characteristics. and one of the things we need to see, and let me make this a different color, um, is that reptiles is the fir are the first animals that we're going to look at that are completely independent of water. Now, as soon as I say that, you're going to think of many types of reptiles that spend their lives in and around water, but that's not what we mean by independent of. They don't require water for their life cycle. They are terrestrial animals. They lay their eggs on land. When we look at the characteristics of the reptiles, we see many of them that uh, relate to this adaptation. And if you think back to our video on amphibians, we talked about amphibians being our transitional animal, our animal that talked to, as we move from the water, you know, everything down here is in water, and the amphibians are kind of in between because they have to uh, start their life in water and then move on to land. But everything from here and up are terrestrial animals, even those that live in and around water. Of course, we'll have some aquatic mammals, but uh, we'll address that when we get there. So let's look at some of these characteristics that relate to uh, reptiles being successful on land. Uh, they have a thick, uh, tough, dry skin with scales to prevent drying out. We're going to prevent desiccation. You can see this lizard skin here with its scales, and if we go back to this picture, we can see these scales, these thick uh, scales overlapping that prevent water loss and that's a, a direct um, adaptation to being successful on land. We've got to prevent uh, loss of water to the dry environment. Another characteristic that we see, it's a little bit subtle, is that the limbs are rotated underneath the body to lift the body up to make locomotion on land a little easier. Now this is a little bit exaggerated and uh, they don't move that easily on land but uh, let's get rid of that guy. Let's think about what we're talking about here with the, the generic skeleton. If we remember, here's a salamander. If we were to look at its skeleton, it has uh, you know, ribs and the skull, but it has the pectoral girdle and the pelvic girdle and the limbs, but the limbs kind of come straight out from the side. In other words, if we were to draw a picture uh, like this, so here's the animal's body, uh, here's the, the legs would come out and then down, and so as it moves across, its belly is dragging on the ground, where as the reptile, we might see uh, the limbs kind of coming out, uh, down at an angle, more like this, lifting the body up off the ground a greater distance, uh, making it easier to move. And I'll bring a picture over that'll help. Here are two reptiles, and you can see how the limbs are underneath the body uh, at an angle helping lift their body up off the ground. And now I have another uh, cool thing to show you which is not quite related but uh, a little bit so we'll let it play. Bacillus lizards are able to run across the surface of the water for a short distance without sinking. Their feet have a large surface area that helps to prevent the foot from breaking the surface tension of the water. This behavior appears to have evolved as an anti-predator defense from land-based predators. And that's pretty cool. So when we look at uh, other characteristics of reptiles and their ability to live on land, probably the single most important one, the defining feature of all the amniotes, is that they have an amniotic egg. Now, 
uh, the reptiles have a leathery shell covering this amniotic egg as opposed to a hard shell that we might see in a bird. Uh, and when we look at reproduction in the reptiles, uh, we have internal fertilization, meaning usually the, the, well, the, the male has to place the uh, male gamete inside the female's body. Uh, and it has to do that because you can't fertilize an egg uh, with a shell around it, so you have to fertilize it before the shell is made. And they have this leathery shell that you can see here and, um, and over here. Um, and it's an amniotic egg, and this uh, the leathery shell is going to allow um, that it to be on land, uh, protects it from drying out, so we can survive uh, out of the water. And let's talk about the amniotic egg. The amniotic egg has very specific membranes uh, inside of it, and so we're going to look at this diagram now. I'll make it bigger so we can see more detail. Um, in, there are four specific membranes in this egg. Uh, the first is the amnion, which is where we get the name from, and that's a fluid-filled sac uh, in which the embryo resides. So we see the embryo here, and it's inside of this sac, which basically has taken the pond in which all eggs uh, are in water, and it's put the pond inside of an egg on land. So this fluid-filled sac, or the amnion, is a kind of a watery environment which the embryo can develop in. So that's the first of our, our membranes that are important. The second is the chorion, and the chorion is this membrane that surrounds this whole area, and this membrane is responsible for gas exchange. We have carbon dioxide uh, going out and oxygen coming in, so we have O2 diffusing in uh, across the leathery shell and then across the chorion, and carbon dioxide escaping, so that's our gas exchange surface. And then we have the yolk sac, and the yolk sac contains nutrients, and this is what the embryo is feeding off of uh, while it's inside the egg, so the yolk sac is for nutrients. I'll change this color in just a minute so you can see it better. And finally we have the Atlantis. Whoops, that's not what I meant. The Atlantis. And let's see if I can get uh, this out of here. And the Atlantis is where we have waste, uh, where we, we um, uh, get rid of our waste products. So as the embryo produces metabolic waste, those waste are stored here. The primary waste that we're storing here is uric acid, which can build up in the cells and become toxic if we if we don't move it out into the space. The al the al allantois uh, also plays a role in gas exchange along with the chorion. So a quick review: our four extra embryonic membranes of the amniotic egg are the amnion, the fluid-filled sac that protects the embryo the chorion, which primary functions for, uh, for gas exchange, the yolk sac, which contains the nutrients for the growing embryo, and the allantois, which is where we store the waste. Now let's move on to some other characteristics of uh, reptiles. Reptiles, like the fish and amphibians, are ectotherms, which means that their internal body temperature is dependent on the external temperatures. Well, as a result, uh, reptiles have a limited habitat in which they can live. They can't live in places where the temperatures are extremely cold. Um, and they engage in what we call behavioral temperature regulation, where they can't metabolically change their temperature. They can through their behaviors. And you see in this picture over here uh, on the right, these uh, uh, turtles are engaging what's called basking behavior. They're warming up. They're getting up out of the water, uh, turning their broadside of their body towards the sun to help warm up. Uh, and you'll see reptiles do this. Uh, get into the sun to warm up or get down into the water or mud to cool off using their behaviors to regulate the temperatures. When we look at the nervous system of the reptiles, it's much like that of an amphibian. They have complex brain. They don't rely too much on vision. Not, not The reptiles' vision isn't great. Some of the lizards have pretty good vision. Uh, they have a fairly good sense of smell. If you look at a lizard, they have an external ear opening. And I'll see if I can find a picture. You can kind of see that here, I think. But we also have some interesting sensory systems that have uh, evolved, in, especially in some of the snakes. Um, the snakes don't have external ear openings, but vibrations that move through the ground 
will move through their jawbone into that inner ear space uh, where the jawbone comes back and connects to the inner ear structures. But they also have a, an organ called the Jacobson's organ. If you see a, a snake stick out its forked tongue, it's basically tasting the air. It's picking up molecules of the air. Then they bring their tongue back in and, and touch it to the structure in the top of their mouth called the Jacobson's organ, which allows them to analyze those molecules of air. And that's how they're basically tasting or smelling the air as they flick their tongue out. And uh, also some of the snakes have uh, pits in their snout, which are heat sensing pits, which allow them to find uh, warm blooded prey in, in the night, in the dark. So they're feeding on mammals or birds, perhaps. These types of snakes are called pit vipers. When we look at the digestive system in reptiles, um, reptiles are carnivores. They, they don't chew, they don't bite and chew, they don't have the teeth for that, but they swallow their prey whole. And snakes have a unique adaptation which allows the back of their jaw to unhinge. So if you think of their jaw as a hinge right here, uh, the two elements of their jaw, uh, they can unhinge so that uh, it can open uh, and, and wider and allow larger prey, actually prey even larger than their jaw to um, um, to uh, be swallowed. Um, another thing that's interesting here is when we look at the pattern of feeding. Uh, reptiles will typically large infrequent meals. Now again some of the lizards which are more active will eat smaller meals and eat more frequently but uh, lots of um, reptiles will eat very large meals or we call it bulk feeding uh, and then they may not eat for many days at a time and in fact if they get a really good meal they could go um, some of like the very large snakes, uh, anaconda and that type of thing will eat an extremely large meal and then basically lay there for the next week digesting. And that's due to their very slow metabolism and their, their low metabolic metabolic needs, they can kind of get away with that. Uh, the reptiles have a pair of kidneys for excretion. Uh, most of the metabolic waste is released as uric acid. And uric acid uh, is related to urine, and you can probably see that from the name, but uh, it doesn't have as much water in it as urine does. It's more of a crystalline structure, and that's an adaptation for life on land and a, as a water conservation mechanism. So it's crystalline rather than liquid, and that's for water conservation. Now the last thing we have to discuss is the circulatory system and gas exchange system because we've been comparing our fish circulatory system to our amphibian system and now we're moving to the reptiles. So we'll start with what we have with the amphibians and see how reptiles are slightly more advanced in some ways and, and greatly more advanced than others. If you recall from our video on amphibians, this is what the amphibian circulatory system looked like. We have a three-chambered heart, uh, a right atrium, a left atrium, and a ventricle the pulmonary loop going to the lungs and the systemic loop going to the body. And the problem with this uh, system was it was inefficient due to the mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood in the single ventricle. So let's look how the reptile heart is slightly better. In the reptile heart, we're going to add a partial wall in the ventricle. Now this is not exactly how it looks, but it's going to be good enough to serve our purpose. This partial wall in the ventricle, and I can make it a little bigger, is going to reduce the amount of uh, mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood in the single ventricle. So we would change this to say three chambered heart with a partial wall in the ventricle, less oxygen rich and, and oxygen poor blood mixing in the single ventricle, not as inefficient as uh, the amphibians, but not as efficient as if we had a complete four chambered heart which, by the way, we do have in the crocodiles and alligators. We have a four-chambered heart. So we need to look at what the four-chambered heart looks like. We also need to make the point why this is important to have this incomplete wall uh, so we have less mixing. And if we did have that mixing, we'd have a big problem because in reptiles we can't use the skin as supplemental gas exchange because it's thick and scaly. Here I've drawn a four-chambered heart. In a Granted, it's a little messy and we'll clean it up and, and draw it again in class, but we have a right atrium feeding deoxidated blood into the right ventricle, which then sends the blood to the lungs. We oxygenate the blood, send it back to the left atrium, to the left ventricle, and from the left ventricle we go underneath here back out to the body. With two separate ventricles, we have no mixing of oxygen-rich and oxygen-poor blood. And again, in reptiles, we only see this in the crocodilians. So here's the review of that section. Again, we have more well-developed lungs in the alligators, or I'm sorry, in the reptiles than we do in the amphibians. So 
uh, we don't have as big of an issue for gas exchange or the mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood as we did in amphibians. All right, so there's our video on uh, vertebrate diversity dealing with the reptiles, and come back for the next part on birds.